got it cut. What's the matter? Stick to the score. That's what matters. I was just doing a little improvisation, Ziggy. You know, drifting, taking it away a bit. Drifting. We rehearse the score as written. No improvisation. Are we playing jazz or aren't we? We are playing my music. My music. Now, you cut out the fancy stuff. Okay, okay. Well, I hired you as a member of a team, not as a solo artist. Okay. Well, remember it. So were we. Are you kidding me? I've never, I'd never seen it. I'm surprised by that. Like, you just didn't get a chance to see it before it premiered? You were shopping it around and just didn't get to see it? Well, I may have seen it with my mother and a couple of friends of mine, you know, in New York, but I don't I don't remember that. It was a great role. You nailed it. I mean, I couldn't believe it was your first time on screen because you own the performance. I mean, you're like, you know, a, I mean, you were a natural, I thought, but espionage is a really good show. I'm I had by. no idea when I started to look at it that I was the lead. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're great in it. Man. Jesus Christ. I said, yeah. wow. I went, my first job was a lead. <laughs> I mean, no wonder the producer was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. The guy was the lead. The espionage was just a opportunity of convenience, right? Because you just happened to be in London, they needed an American. You kind of just pestered the guy, kind of, right? <laughs> Until he just said, hey, okay, let's do it. Yeah. Hello. Hello. My name's Robert Costello. Evgenia Makovskaya. Are you angry at me? Angry? You know, angry, sore, wild. I'm afraid I have made trouble for you. No, I make trouble for myself. I'm an expert. Aren't you going to the party? No, I don't take all that stuffed shirt jazz. Please? Well, stuffed shirt. You know, ambassadors, officials. Oh. What are you doing? I'm saving up American slang. Stuffed shirt? I've studied English at the university, but to be first class, I must know American. I wish you would come to the party. Why? The other guests will wonder why you're not with your group. I have a better idea. Why don't the two of us go out and have a couple of quiet drinks together? You mean alone? No, just the two of us. You, Jane, meet Tarzan. <laughs> I cannot. It's not allowed. Oh, you have your instructions too, huh? I'm your interpreter. I must stay with the group. Does that mean you're going to the party? Of course. We could go together. I would be very pleased. Well, if you put it that way, I'm not going to play hard to get. You mean you will come? It's a deal. You can see how small the roles were around. I just never got any roles that had any beginning, middle, and end. You know, I was guesting or whatever, and I just had a few lines here, a few lines there. Well, you dominated that episode. You showed some depth in that episode, too. I also like how it's ambiguous by the end. Are you a spy? Are you not a spy? No one, you don't know, which I kind of like that. I like by the end, you're like, was it all a misunderstanding? Was he really taking pictures of the stuff outside? You know, no. It's kind of hard to tell at the end, which I like. I thought that was cool. You know. Adding the camera in it was pretty interesting, actually. Yeah. From the writing perspective, you have yeah. a you have a group going to Russia, and the guy's got a camera. I don't know how long that would have been lasted, but <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they would have got that right off the plane, probably. But uh, yeah, yeah, really. It reminded me of the spy that came out from the cold a little bit. 
Oh, kid. I could see that. Very yeah. similar. I mean, sort of similar, sort of subterfuge going on. But yeah, I mean, what a great, meaty first time role. I don't know why my agents didn't use that footage to get me roles that were a little better. You know, I mean, when you start with a guy that has a lead in a show, then you can ask for parts that are pretty good. But I don't know. I, I tell you one thing, if you give me a role that I don't have a beginning, middle and end, I'm really kind of mediocre. to meet Tubby here in Moscow. We take recordings from the radio, from the Voice of America. We also make our own music. Will you play something with us? Well, I don't know, I just... Uh... Yes, oh, please, please. Oh, yes, please. Yes, yes, please. Great. It's a special favor, come on, please. Come. Yes. Okay, how about the big jump? Ready? Did it spark any memories from shooting it at all, from watching it? We were just wondering, um, you know, before we move on, like having watched it, did it, uh, I know it was 55 years ago or something, but did you remember anything about shooting it? Or was, when you were watching it, was it like, like you were like us and had never seen it before or never? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Wow, that's cool. That's super cool. I don't remember the guitar for Christ's sake. I mean, I'm a really? guitar player and I never remembered that. Wow. So obviously, yeah. That's uh, great. Too many joints, man. <laughs> <laughs> too much Acapulco gold. I was going. I was going forward. I wasn't going that way. <laughs> you know? That's great. That's awesome. That's great. So I just wanted to ask, since you know, obviously we've done our research on you, you know, we've, we've been studying your stuff. I know in your book, you say that espionage is your first starring role for television. And it says that on your IMDP page. But in my studying of you, I actually uh, found an article that said that you were in an episode of The Naked City and an episode of Espionage. And Espionage was the second thing you were in. So I was like, oh. Wow. Well, well, so I looked on IMDb, and there's no listing of Naked City for you. No. But I found it, and you are <laughs> in it. Oh, really? And Dustin Hoffman is in the same episode. Wow. And let me show you a little thing here. And Dustin Hoffman plays a killer in it. He robs these people in the beginning. You guys aren't in a scene together, but you're a cop. And I think it's just a quick cameo. You only have a little, uh, a, a quick spot. I don't remember it, so. At well, all. I just thought I'd point it out to you because it's awesome. You're in a, an episode with Dustin Hoffman, but there you are. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's you as, as a, a young policeman. You're in the scene also with Paul Burke, the same guy uh, from 12 O'Clock High. Uh, he's oh, really? in, in the scene too. But also, let's see, where is it? Dustin Hoffman is also in the same episode with you. Huh. Which I thought was pretty wild. And you don't even remember shooting that at all? No. <laughs> I just think that's wild, man. That's awesome. I, I usually remember everything, but I don't remember that. I would think I would have remembered that. I mean, you know. Yeah, you're in a in it with Dustin Hoffman. You would think. What you are would the? Remember. What's the date of it? Do you know? I do. Um, it's the episode is called Barefoot on a Bed of Coals from season four, episode thirty-four, and it aired on May 29th, nineteen sixty-three. Wow. Um, oh, here you are. Can you see this of you? Like, watch this. Reject files. You know how many thousands of files you'd have to look at? Don't you have them on punch cards? Only the members of the police force, not the rejects. 
Can you see that? Or you check out the yeah, 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 I can anyway. see it. What are these? I'm definitely in it. That's all the people that have rented police uniforms in the past 12 months. That are not members of that exactly. Honor. Didn't know we were that popular. It's pretty wild, man. I, I plead then, guilty. And, <laughs> well, you got me. And look, and look, look who else is in it. It's amazing. You're in an episode of The Naked City you don't even remember with Dustin Hoffman. I mean, how amazing is that? Right. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. It's just, it's nuts. But uh, I just I ran into Dustin Hoffman last week and he said he doesn't remember either. <laughs> <laughs> I just That's thought, for sure. I just thought that was wild because it aired May 29th, 1963 on ABC. You, you are uncredited in it. Dustin Hoffman barely makes the credits at the end, but he's like the last name on the credits at the end. You're not mentioned at all, but it's clearly you. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there's, and I never would have found it except I was reading articles about you getting Hallelujah Trail. And it was saying that uh, you had done notable stage work and uh, you had done some television. And it said you had done an episode of Naked City and an episode of Espionage. And I was like, Naked City, what the fuck, really? So I started scouring the internet and then, you know, it took me a while, wow. but I found it. <laughs> I was kind of tripping out. But. Wow. Good morning, Mr. Sloan. Good morning, Sally. Uh, I was 18 and on the surfboard. But Mr. Sloan, I've always had a passion for older men. Thanks a lot. In 67, you did a, a, it's got a cult following and there's not a lot of people that know about it, but it's a family film, a children's film that you did with Mimi Van Doren called You've Got to Be Smart. Do you remember anything about that? Not a thing. <laughs> Are you serious? You don't remember working with Mimi Van Doren? No. Oh, seriously. Don't. I'm seriously. What? How could you forget something like that? Well, I know. I mean, I know how great she is. It's super sexy and everything, but I don't remember her at all. Really? Wow. How could that? Were you like smoking such her. good Acapulco gold? Uh, yeah, I you're kissing no, on her in one scene. Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Jerry, I was. Oh, hi, man. Oh, I'm sorry. They told me you were in here. I didn't know you were with someone. I'll stop by later. It's all right. I was just on my way out. I'm used to these things. Please don't let me interfere. Please interfere. Now there's a man who knows how to say the right thing at the wrong time. Uh, Miss Lynn Hathaway, uh, Mr. Nicholas Sloan. Lynn Hathaway? Yes, that's right. Of the Hathaways. Uh, oil, U.S. Senators. Uh, that's her daddy. Well, well, well. This is a pleasure. I don't believe I've ever seen a million dollars so beautifully packaged, Miss Hathaway. My, but aren't you the subtle one, Mr. Sloan? Oh, uh, Jerry, I just dropped in a check. You will pick me up at 10. Yeah, right after the show. Goodbye, Mr. Sloan. I must say it's been a pleasure. I always enjoy meeting an old-fashioned boy. Came out in 1967, and I don't think it had a huge release. You star in it with her. Uh, you play a con man, discovers this little preacher kid that can sing, and you're trying to make a buck off this preacher kid that can sing. And you're like sort of a womanizing con man. Mimi Are you Van sure Dorn. I did that? I'm pot, dude, it's you. I mean, we have video of you acting in it. <laughs> I, mean, <Wow. laughs> I mean, we know your voice. I mean, you know, we there know was you. It was another Tom Stern. Hold on, give me Can one second. The, Chris? Yeah, show him the clip. Cause it's hey, great, cause you're kissing her. And I'm like, oh, give me one I wanted to ask you what she smells like. <laughs> give me one sec. Let me get, I, let, give I can't me believe I would that. forget that. <laughs> we couldn't believe it either. That's why that's why I'm like, what? Really? Uh, give me one second. Well, what I year was, was that? 1967. And it's you start in it with um, Roger Perry. He played the manager on the Partridge family. It was written and directed by a famous TV writer named Ellis Caddison. Caddison wrote a lot of TV, but I think this is the only movie that he wrote and directed. It's also notable because it's the last film by Gloria Castillo, who was in Night and the Hunter, Reform School Girl, Teenage Monster. She passed away at the age of 45 of cancer, but not too long after this. Sorry, I'm late, baby. Charlie, my usual. Huh? 
Reverend hung me up again. Sloan, if you weren't such a rodent, and if I didn't always get hung up on rodents, I'd drop you but quick. Maybe I will anyway. That's what I love about you, baby. Unbelievable. You put things in such a ladylike way. Oh, Rest in far. Like you, Miss Jack. Easy right. now. Here we go. Aren't we touchy, though? How did I know? Now, wait a minute. Her? Jackson's a great girl. No, that's you. Then what are you doing correct? here? Yes. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Can you verify that? But that is yes. you. You won't I get can. any argument with me on this. Now look, Lynn. Jackson's a nice girl that wants the whole knight in shining armor bit, which I'm very good at. But you're like me. Take people the way they are. Come on. So that's my problem. You. <laughs> Love. But like there you are. Kiss Whoa, it. Whoa, Mamie Van Duren. Yep, right there. Kitty me. Look, here she is. Let's see it again. Oh, oh man. <laughs> Did I not remember that? I know. Did you watch uh, You've Got to Be Smart with Mimi Van Doren at all? Did yeah, I did. <laughs> what did you Get think? Of? Did you remember any of that? No. <laughs> like, like what's How could I you? not remember Mamie Van Doren? I don't know. And that movie is so fucking weird, too. It almost seems like a lost movie. Like, the, it's like the discolor. Like, it's discolored sometimes. You're great in it. Like, the movie's really low budget and not that good. You're giving it your all. But it's obviously a low budget production. The music, oh, yeah. the songs are horrible. I mean, I don't know who wrote those songs, but I was like, but you're actually really funny in it. You're delivering a great performance. I can't say that about some of the other people in the movie. <laughs> but I thought it was pretty, it was interesting, you know? And you even start to sing a song at one point in it. And I don't even know if, no. it's, your, I don't know if it's your voice or what, but I was like tripping out on that. LA is full of nothing but sin, sin. Nothing but sin. Hear me now. L.A. is full of nothing but sin, sin, nothing but sin. That's your town of angels. <laughs> uh, it was a weird movie, very weird. Oh, speaking of weird movies, we haven't even talked about them. Can Harmonious Merkin ever forget Mercy Hump and Find True Happiness? Do you remember that one at all? Well, just imagine, if you would, I get to Malta, and they take me up to the, to the set. And as I look on the set, as I'm walking, and I look on the set, there is Milton Berle, who is obviously nude under a fur coat. Oh my God. Yeah, with a donkey. And the reason why it's funny, <laughs> frankly, is because he had the rep of having the biggest dick in Hollywood. I've heard that. <laughs> so here's the donkey whose dick is 12 inches and his is probably 14. You know, and, and it's going to hang out his camel hair coat any minute. <laughs> and I'm laughing my ass off walking up there. And, uh, <laughs> And then I meet Tony Newley, who tells me what I'm gonna, what I'm supposed to do. But it was really, really a funny set. I got oh, thrown man. Ring this magic bell. Trampolina sped to the royal stables, led her donkey to the witch's lair. Rang the magic bell and it turned the tables, for her donkey vanished in the air. And before her eyes stood a real Prince Charming, but he was the littlest of men. Trampolina cried, this is too alarming. Can I have my donkey back again? <laughs> Never cried a witch like an old hyena, laughed a Trampolina once upon a time. A weird movie. Oh yeah. It's very oh. weird. I really like it though. Did it harken back to your stage play days at all? Because it's almost like a stage play. I mean, the way yeah. that it's presented. Tony Newley said, hey, I got a little part down in Malta. I said, I'm, I'm there. I didn't even hear about the money. I didn't give a shit. He said, well, we're going to pay you. I went, okay, great. I'm there. Because I, I was friendly with him and Joan. Joan Collins. Kind of, yeah. Joan Collins. They were friendly with enough. Samantha and myself. So you know. Didn't uh, Anthony Newley do the music for Dr. Doolittle, which uh, Samantha was on, right? Yeah. 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 He did. I like to point out, too, he did the music for Willy Wonka, amongst other things. I mean, he's a very famous. Oh, my God, yeah. 
musician. Milton Berle is one of the funniest guys of all time. I mean, he was extemporaneous, like uh, an off-the-cuff comedian, like Don Rickles. Okay. I love Don Rickles, but, too. But he's not like Don Rickles, because there are nobody like Don Rickles. But right, right. M Milton lived on sarcasm of everybody and everything. And, you know, he's funny, very funny guy. Right. Newley's production is, like, so... Just a vanity production, really. I mean, it's all about him and how he can't stop fucking women, and he was trying to figure out why he's <laughs> fucking so many women. I mean, like that's why he made the movie. Yeah, I mean, it's great. I mean, it's like, I mean, it's it was it's a great. it was a therapy movie. Yeah, yeah, it's cathartic. Exactly. It's cathartic for you. Yeah. You know, it was well, like it, it. He might he's gonna spend that much money on therapy. He's like, fuck it, I'll just work it out in the movie. And it's very like Carl Jung and Freud, the shadow self, all that shit. It's like he's working and, out. When he when he went to Malta, I mean nobody went to Malta. I mean they all go. Everybody goes to Malta now, but nobody went to Malta then. I, I don't know why. It just wasn't a popular island, you know. That's interesting. But that's where he went, so that was good. Did you enjoy a, a playing that the comedy? Because a funny role. Uh, and it was a lot of comedy. And yeah, I was a play. reporter. I think I was a reporter. You're a producer. You're a pro producer. producer. Yeah. 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 Same thing. No, they're, yeah, they're, 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 <laughs> yeah, you're, you're pissed because he doesn't have an ending. You yeah. Know, you want the, you, you, you want, you want the ending, goddamn it. You never had an ending. <laughs> right, right. Now, well, you started ending. out in comedy on the stage, so it's kind of like going back to that, right? Except for the camera. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Like, yeah. That's what I expected to do in Hollywood. I said, I just came from comedy. Why are you casting me as a killer? <laughs> Gotcha. You're always casting me as somebody's killing or negative, or this, and I'm really just a, a comedy guy. And they went, nah, no, you're not. <laughs> Upset my wife for any reason whatsoever. I'll keep that in mind. Hey, what's going on? Okay, pal. Now show us the compartment in that wreck. Yeah. Hey, buddy, I don't know anything about any compartment. The compartment in Seaver's truck. Now, how do we get in? Hey, I, I don't think you understand. That's not Colt's truck. It's a stunt truck. It just looks like the real one. A stunt truck? Yeah. yeah. Not very smart, Jack. That guy can make us. Not if he's dead, he can't. I like the way you think, Jack. They won't even recognize Ernie when they find him. We're all Ernie. Should have known the salvage business is risky. Mannix, your three minutes are up. Samantha was pregnant pretty quick. And they offered me a series on the St. Lawrence River in the winter. And I told them I didn't want to take my pregnant wife to a location that was going to be freezing cold. And I was going to be working all day. And then she was going to be alone. And on the other side of the coin, I didn't want to leave her alone in LA with her first pregnancy. So I basically turned it down. Then they offered me another role at uh, Universal, and it was like, uh, you know, 10 lines, you know, and I'd just come off of a, a pretty good film, and for whatever reason, I, I didn't get that, and from that time on, I really didn't get offered a role that I really liked for, you know, a year, two years, and then all of a sudden, Angels from Hell comes. I read the script to me, it was the worst fucking biker movie ever made, ever written. All I was doing was, you know, breaking guys' legs on curbs, <laughs> eating the shit out of somebody in a knife fight, and then 
next time I'm fighting somebody and I'm kicking their ass, you know, I'm bent. It's great, but the bikers will all be laughing, believe me, at this movie, because this is just stupid. He's the kind of a guy who enjoys riding into a hell of a mess with the cops. All right, this is it. Now I want you to pack up and get out of here. Angels from Hell, from the producers of Hell's Angels on Wheels. Starring Tom Stern. When he wants a chick, he takes her. And she likes it. When he wants a cop, he cuffs him. When he wants a town, he terrorizes it. You know, the law wasn't just designed to protect the squares. It was designed to protect us, too. I had no idea it was going to end up the way it's ended up, but... And even then, I didn't know that it, that it had some notoriety until I talked to you guys. But for me, uh, that was it. But I said, you know, he's offered me money. He's offered me six, seven grand or 10 grand. I mean, it was not much money, but it was it was more money than I was getting at the time. Well, Clint did good. And, and besides, who wants to sit around while, you know, your wife's working and you're not? I mean, come on. Yeah. Anyway, so. I said yes. So I go up there and I made up my mind I was going to do it the best I knew how, regardless of whether I liked it or I didn't like it, you know? And so I did everything. And one of the nice things that I did was meeting the Alaskan bear. Jay York, I found him by the way. His real name was Jay York. Jay York. He, uh, mm -hmm. Him and his brother were known as the Alaskans. They were big yeah. uh, wrestlers. And uh, right. he passed away in 95, but, but he was a wrestler for like 25 years, up until like 1988 or so. Couldn't have been a nicer guy. The guy was big as a house. I don't even think he looked as big as he really looked when I looked at the film. I mean, he was literally, I'm gonna say, 14 inches taller than I was. Not, not this much. I'm talking about this much. You know, the guy was just huge. And I I laughed my ass off. I said, I'm gonna kick your fucking ass all over this film. And he laughed and I laughed and we just had a lot of good fun. And stoned a lot. Oh hell yeah. Oh, that's out there with Jeremy Slate, who uh, I think had a, a cameo role in the movie, and, oh. and we were talking about biker films, and I said, you know, I'd like to make a biker film that kids could see, because up to that moment, I knew nobody was going to see Angels from Hell. The one scene I never wanted in there was breaking a guy's leg. Even today, I look at it and go, ugh. Well, I love you know, it. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> Curb them. Oh yeah, my God, great. you talk about a guy who's mean. Yeah. Yo. <laughs> no. No, no. <laughs> I, I recommended that movie to a friend of mine recently, and he watched it on uh, Amazon Prime. And he said, uh, yeah, I'm watching Angels from Hell. He's like, about halfway in, I realized this guy's a fucking sociopath. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, I'm not sure if I really like this character. He's fucking crazy. <laughs> like, I was just like laughing. <laughs> but it's like so true. But, uh, yeah, I mean. And I, and I thought, quite honestly, I didn't think that movie would see the light of day. Uh, director uh, Bruce Kessler was a, uh, he's a big TV guy. And then he yeah, went he, on to do a bunch of cult movies and stuff like that. Yeah, too. he used to be a stuntman. I got along with him great. I mean, you know, he was a super guy. 
Yeah, I mean, this uh, this was the follow-up to Joe Solomon's uh, Hell's Angels on Wheels. He also went on to do, you know, Run Angel Run, The Wild Wheels, Werewolves on Wheels, all that stuff. <laughs> but this was his second one, I guess. I thought it was interesting, too, because uh, you're Irish in this one again. And how will you trail your Irish? In this one, you're Mike Connery, and you got uh, you have your... On your gas tank, you have the four-leaf clover, <laughs> you oh, really? know, which I thought was funny that you're Irish again in this one. When I got offered that, I really felt bad that I hadn't gotten a better role that had a beginning, middle, and end. I didn't get a one like that for years, and all of a sudden, this guy wants me to lead in this film. I read it. God, this is fucking terrible, but I'm the lead. Whatever it is, I could do more than I'm doing, sit here waiting for a, a call. Got my mind in an open gear. I'll unwind till the road is clear. Move out, gotta get out of here. Gotta find what it's like up there. Never gave it any respect, you know, because it was it was so violent that only guys could see it. I mean, you know, guys and their girls could see it. But living by their own laws. Don't burn from your own people, Dennis. Only punks do that. This is something I want to ask you about, something I've been wanting to ask you about for quite a while. Um, I'll bet. <laughs> so, um, you obviously, since 1968, all on, and I'm assuming probably just because of the success of Hell's Angels 69, but there's a lot of motorcycles in your book. There's uh, Angels from Hell, Hell's Angels 69, then right after that you did a uh, mod squad where you're a biker leader, which I'm sure, you know, was from the success of Hell's Angels 69. But then even in uh, Play Pigeon, you steal a police motorcycle and you're riding it around. There's a lot of motorcycles in your work. And in your book, you don't even talk about riding at all. I was just wondering how long were you riding? Did you learn to ride when you were young? Like, were you, you know, like... Hey, I still don't know how to ride. I never knew how to ride. You, what are you talking about? There's so many <laughs> scenes with your... I know, I know. And I was always... They had to start the fucking motorcycle for me. What? Yeah, in the, when they used the old bikes in, uh, in Hells Angels, yeah, they, they weren't like you hit a button and they go off. Sure, you had sure. to pump them with yeah, your, yeah. With your sure. you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, you know, the guys who were grips, they always started the engine before I even got here. I mean, I did that. Yeah. And so, <laughs> I'll just tell you one story. When I got Hell's Angels 69, I figured I ought to, you know, I ought to know how to ride. I mean, riding a bike doesn't look that difficult to me. I went down and bought a bike. And we were, I was living with Samantha up in uh, Sunset and Sunset Plaza. And I rode the bike home. And you know how the curbs are, you know, that they go, go together like this, you know, like a yeah. V? Yeah, yeah. Well, my tire hit one of those Vs and I went off it on the way home. <laughs> and I said, this is not for me. I mean, obviously, I don't know what I'm doing. So. Well, let's go get our pigeon. It's not a lot of bikes. But you, well, I mean, there's a scene, for instance, in uh, Hell's Angels 69, when you're going to get your pigeon. Oddly enough, you say, "I'm a, let's go get our pigeon. And you go after the Hell's Angels. But you guys are hassling that guy in the convertible. Right. And you're riding up next to him, clearly on your bike, riding it. And you're hitting yeah. his car and yeah. grabbing him and stuff. And as I was watching that, I was thinking, this looks incredibly dangerous. Like you could have easily <laughs> ate shit, went underneath the car. Like it's not, a, and you can tell it's not a rig. You can tell that you're not being shot from like the waist up. Like you're riding that thing and you're swerving over and you're hitting him and you're swerving back over. And yeah, like, yeah. 
I'm surprised. It's it's just surprising to well, me. I could ride could, bikes. Yeah. I could ride bikes, but I never chose them as my apparatus, you know, of choice. Okay, gotcha. And I never yeah. owned one. And everybody around me always owned a lot of bikes, you know. While we're on bikes, actually, I had a question from a, a guy about bikes, actually, on Instagram. Yeah, this guy, uh, he has an Instagram, Motorcycles and Movies. He owned a Hollywood bike shop for 15 years, and they would um, rent out bikes to movie studios and stuff like that. All he wanted to know was uh, when it came to Hells Angels 69, he just wanted to know anything about the bikes, where you acquired them, who built them, if the angels were riding their own bikes in some of the scenes. Or... The angels were riding their own bikes all the time until they got into the desert. When they got in the desert, you have to use the desert bikes. You know, you have to use off-road bikes. And those big Harleys are not for off-road. They're, they're road bikes. So they had to all go into these funny little off-road bikes. And because they had to, they looked so funny on the off-road bikes, gave me the impetus to hire a bunch of guys in Vegas, you know, to pretend they're angels and ride down the road front of uh, Caesar's Palace and turn into the hotel. That's all I needed him for. And nobody realized there wasn't an angel there in Vegas, not one. There was one always in the hotel with me, but there was never any angels in Vegas because they wouldn't let them there. So I had to shoot all that stuff another way. I used Caesar's Palace, but I had to get in there, you know, and I had to drive up to it. And I had to tell the guy, hey, park it, you know, they can deal. You know, the biggest problem we had was that on the last day of shooting in the desert, Jeremy broke his leg. Oh, sure. Last day of shooting. So he went to the hospital and they cast him up and everything. And so they said, well, you, you're going to stop the movie, right? I said, fuck no. I'm stopping shit. So you guys just had to uh, wait a while and then um, hide the cast like with some with his pants or something and shoot him from the waist up once he was healed or? What I did was I only needed him to stand up and turn. That's all I needed him for. He could still do the scenes, but when he was, the scene was finished and I had to cut it, he had to turn in place. Once he turned, started to move this way, I cut. So you never saw that he had a cast on. So I lost a week. The first day back for Jeremy, we had this morning shoot. I'd gotten Clark Palo, who did the Spielberg film. So it was a first rate crew. So when we went over to the Angels, they were all drunk and everything, all shit broke loose. One thing I wanted to say about uh, Hell's Angel 69, though, is it's a unique biker movie because it's really a caper flick disguised as a biker movie. It's really like uh, Ocean's Eleven with the Hell's Angels in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, and wasn't it a, was it AIP that said if you can get the Angels, you got a movie, basically? Yeah. 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 Because I had written, I had this picture, and Larry Gordon was uh, the head of production over there. It was a friend of mine, so I gave it to him, and you know, I said. You know, I, th I think this would be terrific. And he said, it is terrific, but for us, if you get the angels, we'll do it. That's the only guys I wanted. Violence is their thing in play. In love. In anger. Even to each other. 
So you guys worked on a, the Devil's Brigade. Uh, you worked on a, a gun smoke together. You worked on Hells Angels 69. But I believe Devil's Brigade is yeah. the first thing you're on together, right? Did you meet on that or did you know each other before? Or do you remember? Not really, but we were friends right from the beginning. I mean, you know, I mean, okay. we just got along real well. I knew him because he was a pretty well-known actor, much more well-known than I was. And he was in a lot of shit. That, I saw and uh, so we got friends we got to be friends just during the movie you know went out and clowned around every once in a while but not much I feel honored that Dustin and I got to meet the two of you together at a screening of Hells Angels 69 like 15 years ago I mean who gets well, to say that like we yeah. got to yeah. meet him with you and like Dustin yeah. got his autograph and like oh really I, yeah I can yeah. tell you maybe right here yeah he got both uh, of your autographs on that right. lobby card right there yeah uh, yeah, yeah, both of you guys signed it. It was kind of, that was a cool moment, you know? I mean, I thought that was pretty neat. Somebody said that uh, we looked alike, and that was the basis of my movie. For the brothers? Of the Hell's Rob. Angels. Yeah, I looked at him and said, how about two brothers? Get the angels to rob Caesar's palace. That's a hell of a movie. <laughs> a few things on Hells Angels 69. A lot of people actually started out their careers on that film either early on, and some people got their start on that film, and I don't think a lot of people even realize that. Like the writer, Don Tate, he had an interesting career because he wrote a lot of television shows like Bonanza, Maverick, 77 Sunset Strip, Green Hornet. Oh, yeah. He did a biker movie, Chrome and Hot Leather, and then tons of Disney movies. Like Disney hired him to write like everything in the 70s pretty much. Yeah. You know, uh, the, after uh, Hell's Angels, he went crazy as a writer. He was there busy, busy. Yeah, busy. yeah. Well, for Disney, I mean, it was just all Disney pretty much. It was yeah. crazy, you know. I mean, uh, your stunt gaffer was Bob Harris, who was like a stunt legend. He had done Bullet right before this. Yeah. And then right after this, yeah. he went on to do Dirty Harry, The Deer Hunter, Goonies, Commando. And, uh, and the director of photography, Paul Lohman, it was his very first movie as DP. He went on to do Coffee, a silent movie with Mel Brooks, North Dallas 40, Time After Time, you know, Mommy Dearest, uh, you know, tons of stuff. Uh, really started all those guys, huh? <laughs> pretty much, you did, man. <laughs> I mean, like, I don't think people realize that. That's I don't funny. think they realize that. I mean, uh, um... Including me. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. I thought you should know that. I thought you should know Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> um, Every film has a critical moment in it where it's kind of earth shaking. The film could stop for one reason or another, either somebody getting hurt or somebody getting the flu or somebody, I mean, whatever. Every film's got one of these moments that is really, is it gonna be on? Is it gonna be off? We gonna fold it, we gonna go, whatever. They all have this one moment that everybody sits back and goes, is this going to be worth it, really? <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah. And you just imagine, I mean, Hollywood makes these $150, $200 million films, and they have these moments, too. Yeah. No shit. You know, no shit. Yeah. You know every one of them says, now they're even going to be worse. Yeah. yeah. Can, we, can we afford to do this? What happens if that, that happens? Yeah. Will our insurance mm -hmm. cover it? Uh, in Clay Pigeon, yeah. that was every week. Yeah, every day, you mean. <laughs> it sounded like every single day. But oh, I mean, man. It's crazy. Unexplained war to be caught up in another. 
You look pretty comfortable. Who are you, anyway? I got a job for you. No deal. Get yourself another pigeon. Shortly after Hell's Angels 69, you did a great guest starring appearance as the heavy in Mod Squad and an episode called uh, Town Called Sincere. Did you meet Buddy Ruskin as a result of being on that show? Because I know he has a, a story credit and a screenplay credit on Clay Pigeon and he created Mod Squad. So I was wondering, is there a he connection? Did? Yeah, he, he's the creator of Mod Squad. I never of, knew that. I did research on him. I thought it was very interesting because in the 50s, he was a squadron leader for a group of narcotics officers. Really? And uh, the show, The Mod Squad, is loosely based on his real life experiences with these young narcotics officers in the 50s. He would send them to like beatnik clubs and they'd infiltrate like drug rings and stuff. But, you know, I never really noticed until I started doing research, like some deep research on Clay Pigeon, but it says story by Buddy Ruskin and Jack Gross Jr. Screenplay by Ronald Buck, Buddy Ruskin, and Jack Gross Jr. So I was just, part of me wondered too, like, I mean, we'll talk about this later. Of course, the studio didn't promote the movie that much for reasons that we'll discuss, but I was kind of surprised, like, since Buddy Ruskin has story credits, why didn't they put on there, you know, from the creator of Mod Squad and, you know, that kind of shit. It seems like that would have helped sell the movie, promote it, you know, it's weird. Well, I'll tell you, my only connection with those guys frankly, was uh, Buck, because they had already done the screenplay with Buck when I was looking around for something to do that I could both direct and star in. And I knew this guy was up in Canada who'd already told me he would love to finance my next film. And I kind of believed him. You know, he sat down at his house in Vancouver one time, and uh, we smoked a couple of joints, he was a trillionaire, or at least that's what he told me. And so I heard about this screenplay, and I don't know how, but Ron Buck was a guy that owned 9,000 Sunset. He was a very wealthy kid. And I'd run into him a lot, and I heard about this screenplay, so I called him, and I asked him whether I might be able to read it, and he wasn't having much success with it, so it appeared he wasn't, let's put it that way. You see, I come on up and get it. I went, okay. So I went over and I got the screenplay and went home, read it. And I went, wow, this is good for me. I mean, it was, nobody had ever done a film about a returning vet yet. The only one that had been done was the Green Berets. And if you know anything about me at all, I, I like the uniqueness of stories that I get involved in. So I got involved. I knew where the money was. So when I read it, I said, I like it, I'd like to do it, uh, can we make a deal? And usually the deals I made were six months to a year tops because you have no control, really. So Ronald Buck essentially developed the screenplay with Buddy Ruskin and Jack Gross Jr. before you were even involved. So, th so yes. the screenplay was already kind of locked in. Right. And I'm just curious, and I'm curious about this because Buddy Ruskin you know, has lead story credits on it, and he was an ex-cop. I had absolutely no idea how to make use of him. I, I didn't even know what you just said. Buck never talked about him. Yeah. Buck only talked about himself and writing the screenplay. And he didn't tell me about a rewrite from Ruskin or yeah. any of that, you know. We'll never know these answers because Buddy Ruskin has passed away, but uh, I'm just curious, you know, his version of the screenplay and, and his story, since he has a background in the police and was a squadron leader, the script is so subversive and so anti-establishment, and so anti-government, anti-police. I'm just wondering, like, if the script he wrote, you know, is what wound up on screen or if it was totally rewritten, but I guess you don't really know. It's just, it's just interesting, you know, it's just kind of interesting. I don't think that Buck could have thought of all the stuff that was in there, frankly. So it probably was now that I hear know it that. from you. Yeah. There's probably a lot of Ruskin in there. Okay, cool. Uh, and maybe I even met him, but I, I don't remember meeting him, let's put it that way. Well, I bought the Mod Squad set just to get your uh, episode. So I have the whole collection and I've been watching them recently. And for the time, they're very um, edgy and dark and subversive. I mean, the very first episode, these three kids are recruited into this secret cop organization and you know there's these guys drugging girls with lsd and making sex tapes with them and like blackmailing their parents with the sex tapes who are political figures like pretty edgy shit for 1967 wow. i think when it started you know i didn't see the screenplay till 70 
Yeah, I was just curious because I mean, the script is so, like I said, anti-establishment. And since yeah, he yeah, was part yeah. of the establishment, I thought it would be interesting. You know, too bad we can't talk to the guy. It's just, you know, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, Actually, all those things were the things that attracted me. <laughs> sure, <laughs> I could see that because that <laughs> that's sort of a theme in your work too: anti-establishment, anti-hero. You know that yeah, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, Good time Joe is about to become the man in the middle, the patsy, the sucker, the clay pigeon. Hail the hero and wish him well, because man, believe me, he's going to need it. What was the, what was the flack you got back about? about the story of the film. Like, did, did some people not like it? I never got any flack until one day I was told uh, by a, an attorney who's since dead, who was the CIA agent for MGM. In other words, CIA had a person in every studio. I've heard that before. Well, it was there to look at the product that was coming out publicly. Mm -hmm. and so I got very friendly with this guy who told me one day, he said, you know, your movie's going nowhere. He told me that. I said, why? He said, because the CIA doesn't want it out there. They really don't. I mean, you're anti-government, you're pro-marijuana. In those days, pro-marijuana in 70, 71, that was a no-no. They did it to Cassavetes too. You know, anything he did that was, and it was, most of it was a bit subversive. Oh yeah. Yes, I never realized up the stand, you know, how serious they were about marijuana. Been on the federal statutes for years, but frankly, I didn't know and I didn't care. I was just making a movie about a returning vet. And as far as I was concerned, a returning vet would be smoking marijuana. No doubt about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I didn't, I didn't deal with heroin. I could have dealt in heroin. Been the right. same thing. Could I? Could have been stabbing my arm, you know. Well, you do talk about heroin, actually, and it's uh, it's an anti, very anti-heroin movie, very anti-hard yeah, yeah. drug movie. I mean, the yes, movie's definitely. very anti-hard drugs. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so he told me that, and I said, well, thanks. <laughs> thanks right. for telling me that. I really appreciate it. So I knew right away that, you know, things were going to be difficult. When I never got the screening, I mean, I felt the difficulty way before that, but when they told me that, I mean, I had to actually bludgeon them to get a screening. They didn't want to give me a screening. Well, they had nothing invested in it. They only had 50 grand, you know, it was finishing money. It was just the money that I needed to finish the edit. And apparently the guy that made the deal, who was a attorney in New York, I don't remember seeing the papers. I mean, I obviously signed them. I mean, you know, you have to sign things. I was so wrapped up in the film that when he told me I got 50 grand, I went, wow, that's great, because that's what I needed to finish the movie, editorially. That, that's all MGM put into the movie was 50 grand? Everything else you raised, right? Which was, what, $600,000 or something? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Wow. 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 That is incredible. I mean, I raised that at night. Yeah, I know, you were, <laughs> so you were <laughs> shooting during the day. Not only are you producing, directing, and starring for the first time during the day with this amazing cast, you're raising the money at night. Like shooting yeah. during the day, raising the money for the next day at night, right? Right. And nobody, I mean, including people working with me, knew what I was doing. Wow. Wow. Because wow. I, I thought if, if they knew, they'd blab. Sure. No, I just didn't want any blab, so. It's amazing. Uh, the one guy out. that knew what I was doing was Frank Avianca, who was the, uh, was my, my connection to bad money, which I never got. I never got bad money. Your Canadian financier fell out and then you were just scrambling constantly just to get this thing done. I mean, when he dropped away, I had all this stuff done already. I mean, all the actors and everything were signed. I mean, I was full on going. Pay or play, right? You have to pay him no matter what. Yeah, no, I, I, all the pressure was on. Sure. And so my decision to find out, you know, the cash flow of the picture, to take on the weekly nut was, I guess, born about by marijuana. <laughs>
<laughs> Wait. I have no idea. Awesome. Yeah, I, sm- I smoked it the whole time I did the film. I mean, that's what kept me going, just about, you know. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. That's so funny. You can see scenes where my eyeballs are like in my knees. <laughs> no, I, uh, <laughs> you know. You're probably getting no I, sleep at all. You're probably getting no. like a couple hours of sleep a night, maybe. I, yeah. I didn't need much sleep, but <laughs> I didn't mind that part very much. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, the only thing that I minded was somebody finding out about it. Sure, you're probably laying awake at night. You probably couldn't sleep. <laughs> probably just, you know, yeah. I can imagine, yeah. Wow. Um, so the thing that really was outstanding was the night that I woke up and realized I owed six hundred thousand dollars. That'd be tough. Yeah. That yeah. was the night. Wow. That, <laughs> I can imagine. Oh my God! It's a midnight experience. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Redford, the assassin with a badge, the super cop. Redford, the man who needed a pigeon and found one. Setting your own epitaph, hero. Things haven't changed much, have they, Joe? Another dirty jungle, another fight to stay alive. Savalas, Robert Vaughn, Burgess Meredith, John Marley, Ivan Dixon, Marilyn Aiken, and Tom Stern as Joe Ryan, the Clay Pigeon. Well, Jack Lardy at ICM recommended uh, Telly Savalas to you, but how did you get like Burgess Meredith, Robert Vaughn, uh, John Marley, Ivan Dixon? I mean, the cast is the cast is incredible. I mean, especially for like, you know, your debut big production. It's like, I mean, it's not your debut big production. You produced Hell's Angel 69, but you know what I mean? This has a level of actors in it that are a lot bigger. You know? Yeah, but you know, once you got a Zavallis to play the lead, then everybody else believed you, you know? Well, they all fell into place, kind of. And all the parts were pretty good parts. Sure. And those guys are character leads. They're, they don't, they don't co- co- cover a movie. But when you put them all together, it's pretty formidable cast. Hell yeah, it's a great Hell ensemble yeah. piece. Everybody knew what they were doing, you know, you, you knew that, so you didn't have to worry about them knowing their lines or coming prepared or being drunk or any of that kind of crap, you know. Uh, Savalas is smooth as fuck in it, just like always. I mean, he's just, yeah. he's floating through the movie like, you know, like, like, <laughs> like, yeah. exactly. I mean, like it's like effortless, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just, you know. All of them treated the movie like it was like, a, you know, piece of cake. I'm just gonna go get paid. I was wondering about like Burgess Meredith, you know, he's never played a role like that before. He's a welder, he's smoking weed, he's playing grab ass, he's driving dune buggies around. I was, just, which is so awesome, but like, I was wondering what he thought of the material and what he thought of the character. Cause he's never, I've never seen him play anything like that before. No, he never did. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why I think he did it. Yeah. You know, he didn't care. He didn't really care about how big the movie was or how small the movie was. It, he just went there to get paid and do this crazy fuck. And he was incredible. He steals like, every scene he's in, pretty much. I mean, he's great in every scene he's in. You know, I mean, he's like... The first, he was the first guy I ever directed. Oh, yeah, during the welding scene, right? Yeah, first, first scene, him- yeah, first scene I ever directed was the welding scene. And he fucked up about three or four times in a row on purpose. <laughs> That's great. Just to That's fuck so over me. This was my first day. <laughs> you know, so and finally I said to him, you fuck. Get it right. <laughs> Stop fucking around. He was he hazing you. He laughed his ass off. Then. Just hazing you a little bit, huh? Yeah. Okay, let's go. He's the uh, best. I mean, he's the best. Who doesn't Oh, uh, I love him, man. Yeah. He was just bad. Like, he just seems like such a sweet guy. Who, whose idea was it to put him in a poncho? Because he looked... <laughs> that he looked great awesome. in a poncho. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a better choice than... than you're asking uh, me, and I don't even remember yesterday. <laughs> you're asking me about a fucking poncho. He was in a movie with Mimi Van Doren. He doesn't even remember that. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't remember kissing Mimi Van Doren, you know you got a problem. Yeah. Exactly. 
too funny. That's too funny. I, I love when you're riding around in the dune buggy with with oh, him because yeah. he's driving. He's clearly him driving. Like it's not a oh, stuntman. Yeah. And I was like thinking, man, to be in a dune buggy, Burgess Meredith driving me around on Hollywood must have been so cool. Must have been the coolest thing. Oh, it's great. <laughs> you know, I bet. It's so Anytime funny. I could get with him, that was terrific. He was a great guy. Yeah, yeah, I just yeah. didn't have enough. I didn't. I didn't have any more for him to do, or I, I would have done it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How does the world look to you now you fought for? I don't know, man. I'm expecting too much, I think, you know? It's really tough to get into. You know, I can really dig walking on sidewalks. Don't blow up in your face. Uh, or a little air that doesn't smell of gun smoke. But I don't know, Freedom, man. I, I can't figure out what the hell's going on. I mean, why is everyone so uptight? I don't know. They've thrown away the things that really made them free. Now they need him again. They can't find him. In Clay Pigeon, yeah. how do we do this movie with no money? <laughs> you know, you're gonna stop. What are you gonna do with the actors? And I went, Jesus Christ, it'll cost me a fortune if I have to pay the actors. Yeah. Oh, man. And I don't have any money for the movie. So what am I going to do? So being a shortcut man, <laughs> <laughs> I thought of the easiest way to do the movie is to do the movie. I only have to raise enough money for the week. It's guerrilla style. If I, could, if I could raise it for three weeks or four weeks, I only got six weeks. So. Wow. And I did it for five weeks, but in the sixth week, I had to tell everybody. You know, I told them all, I said, I never had any money for this movie. I've been raising money every night. And uh, I'm just ask you guys if you'll finish the movie with me, I mean, because I'm not going to be paying you. And they all said, yeah, of course you're going to finish the movie with me. Oh, wow. Well, love you, man. Let's go. Oh, that's wow. super cool. That's super cool. But all these actors, you know, they, they knew. In the last week, they knew. Wow. Wow. In fact, they said, how the fuck did you do that? <laughs> yeah, I'm said, still trying to figure it out. <laughs> oh, well, I had to give away my firstborn, but other than that, it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Holy cow. Are all the locations you shot at basically guerrilla shoot? No permits or anything? Because you shoot on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, you shoot at the Hollywood Bowl. You can't even shoot the Hollywood sign now I got, without paying somebody. Uh, actually, I got the Hollywood Bowl for one day. Nice. That's all they would give me is one day. I said, that's all I need. Oh, wow. And until the director said, you need three days to shoot this. And I said, bye-bye. We're going to shoot in one day. And I, went, an down, I went down there and I plotted the entire day shoot where cameras were gonna go, where they were gonna start, where they're gonna go second. And I diagrammed the whole bowl myself. And I told them, I set every camera angle and I had three cameras. So I always had one moving down. So I had three and then the third guy, he'd move down. Then that guy would move down until we covered the entire bowl. And then I had everybody in front of the camera. I got that because I, knew Yogi Bhajan pretty well in those days. I used to go and chant like every other stupid guy. <laughs> I did it, you know, got this up at five in the morning and chant. Uh, you know, I mean, got to be It's amazing anyway. you got him in that because it's such a violent scene. I mean, yeah, yeah. You guys, I, I, love, I love how when they're shooting, they're shooting, they're still chanting. Everyone's still <laughs> chanting while they're shooting. No one stopped. And then no. when you ax that dude, they all start screaming. <laughs> yeah. But it's That's not until bad. you hit the dude with the axe. The minute you no, hit no, the they, they, they went before that, but but they didn't go much before that. <laughs> and I told them, when you feel when you feel like you can't sit there anymore, leave. I said because there's going to be guns, guns firing all around, and people running and everything. And I leave it up to you. When you're uncomfortable, get them all up and leave. You know, and uh, Yogi Bajan was great. Terrific guy. There's such a surreal element to the entire film. Well, you, you know, know, nobody picked up what I was trying to do. It was really weird because I took the position. One of the things I liked about it was that the guy that jumps over the grenade, right, me, go. it didn't go off. But 
Maybe it did. Well, I assumed that it did, and then I said, well, that would make everything really obscure, and, and it allows me artistically to do any fucking thing I want, because it's not real. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, no one picked that up. Right. No one. Yeah, I put a guy in a white jail. I mean, Jesus, give me a break. The jail is like, <laughs> Alone. It, it's a wider than any hospital room you've ever oh been Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> yeah I made like, sure it was that. I mean, I yeah. wanted it to be obscure. Yeah. And so everything I did in that film was ridiculous. Imagine the truck roll and the, and the getaway scenes. I mean, they're impossible. It could not have happened. That's all there. I mean, there's a, a when you have the gun to, to Heli Savalas's face. Well, he says you're not in the jungle anymore, Joe. And you say, I never left. That's what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's films like, you know, uh, Jacob's Ladder or like Inception that are borrowed that idea after this movie came out, you know. Sure. Yeah, um, yeah. Similar themes. Well, nobody yeah. saw this movie. I mean, they may have. There have been, a, you know, a person maybe in Boston that was there. Or I think it went to New York uh, for a couple of days or whatever. But Overall, nobody really saw the film. And, and none of the reviewers picked up the fact that it was all based on, on the bomb going off. Final based scene's on, the bomb going off. Yeah, that's You that dive based. on him and it blows up. That's the final scene. I mean, it's, yeah. it's all there, basically, right. right? Well, I mean, it's also just a metaphor for how you're living your life in the film anyway. Like, you died in Vietnam, so every second you have after that is, it's all, all right. over. Right, yeah. Time. Yeah, yeah. He's just killing time, basically. He's like in purgatory, yeah. just kind of roaming around, gathering scraps and stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know the old story when you when you get into a bad situation and your life flashes in front of you? Sure, yeah, yeah. That's like that. You know? That's what yeah. that was. Yeah, that's what I figured it was, but that the, nobody picked it up but me. I didn't see a single review ever comment on the weirdness of the film. Like to get high? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah? Uh. Well. I'll tell you what we'll do. If I find the joint. Good. Remember, it's illegal. I know. So is what I'm thinking. As a reward for a beautiful kiss, I sent you with a golden joint. Thank you. What made you get high? You did. You turned me on. Yeah. That's why I wanted to see you again, because I wanted to tell you about it. When you were in Vietnam, I think you had an advantage. I mean, you learn to live for right now, right this minute. You didn't have time to think about tomorrow. You didn't have time to think about what happened yesterday. I mean, everything is now. And when you came back, that's what you tried to teach me. But I was so busy being jealous, possessive, worrying about our future and uptight about the grass that you just couldn't wait around for me to get my head straight. I just blew it. No, you didn't. Oh, Joe, I still want your mouth on me. So whenever I had a problem with location, I used my own. I mean, I shot that house five different ways that I lived in. All that house was my house. <laughs> oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, that, that's good. The, the scene where the, the guy gives her a, a shot, that's my bedroom. Sitting around in the living room, that was my living room. My paintings on the wall, mine. Robert Vaughn's the weirdest oh, God. drug dope kingpin of all time. I mean, he's, he's fucking awful. <laughs> but he's not beating young girls. He's like educating his henchmen on the longevity of butterflies. And he's always hanging yeah. out with his exotic birds and reciting poetry. 
but then he's slapping young girls around and then killing them. And who was dressing them in that? I mean, his outfits are fucking insane. In that. I had no idea, but they, <laughs> but he was just awful. <laughs> I mean, he's the nicest guy, though. I got to tell you, they all were terrific guys. He never anyway. stopped shouting and screaming either. It, like every line of dialogue, he's angry and aggressive. I don't even <laughs> you know, find like, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. He's standing around here yeah, with a bear in his house. Was oh. the guy that owned the Daisy, oh. the Jack Hansen, oh. oh, and that's, cool. that's his tennis court there where I used to play every every weekend. Oh, oh, that's cool. So I used I used everybody. Believe me, I used everybody and everything I could think of that wouldn't cost me any money because yeah. I didn't have any money. Right, right. <laughs> so I couldn't pay for locations or stuff like that. You know. I, sure. I mean, you've got so many great locations and so many amazing shots, especially for a, a, a fund as you go production. I mean, something that you're doing as you go. I mean, you know, you have a helicopter, you have a fucking truck that flips over 25 times. You know, you got this amazing cast. I mean, the fact that the film came out as well as it did for 600,000 is a testament to you as a producer and a director, I think. I mean, it's. Because it's a movie, it's a real movie. I mean, it's, I mean, it, it should be like an unfinished movie. You know what I mean? But it's all there. You know, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. And I mean, we're still talking about it. I don't know if you're aware of this, but it's, you know, you know, it has never gotten an official release in what 49 years, not even on VHS. But uh, some company just released a, a bootleg DVD. Really? If you have it, yeah. It doesn't have any end credits, and it's got some scenes that drop out like really quick. But it's nice. It's the entire film from beginning to end. It's not. Where did you get that? I ordered it online. It came out quietly on DVD. I think I got it on Best Buy's website. It's a bootleg, obviously. I think, but it's it's really good quality, though. I mean, especially for something that you've never had, you know, uh, available before. Because I remember you gave me a copy of, I think it was a, a European bootleg on VHS called Trip to Kill a long time right. ago, and that exactly. was the only one that was ever available, right? Trip to Kill right. on VHS. But you should get this if you don't have it, or I'll send it out to you or something. Nobody's ever seen the goddamn film, and you know, as a guy that poured his heart and soul in that fucking thing. Right, yeah. right. And every dime he ever had, I, I thought it had a little more value in the time of government control of the, of the human spirit in regard to marijuana, in regard to all the problems that the kids were having all over the country. How many kids went, went to jail in Texas for a joint? You know, sure. Or, or one of these other states, really, it was stupid. But Joe, we're going to need your help. I'm out of help, man. So are those kids? Yeah. I know, but I'm finished with that cops and robbers routine. I pass. Mm -hmm. So what happened back there had no effect on you, right? The fact that the elimination of one man might bring that no return figure up to 10%? The fact that literally thousands of kids could be saved? That's unimportant to you, right? Just let them die on smack and speed. Because you, big shot, you pass. Damn it. You know what put the ex in cop? Good cops being sent to Siberia. Bought judges. Police with their palms out. Corrupt politicians that don't and won't tell the people of this country what the hell's going on. Boy, you're naive in a lot of ways, super cop. That scene back there tore my insides out, and I was in a bloody good-for-nothing war! And second of all, even if you did catch Mr. Hard Drug, he'd get three to five. While some poor kid in Nevada, Texas, Alabama, or some other state in this country is gonna get five to ten years for possession of a roach, which, in case you don't know it, is the end of a marijuana cannabis joint. Now, Mr. Hard Drug will be back on the streets in one year for good behavior, while that kid, who don't know how to buy off fat judges on the take, is going to have five years of his life, of his youth, taken away for smoking something that isn't even a drug. Now, you listen, super cop. When you can guarantee me that Mr. Hard Drug gets the electric chair or the gas chamber for feeding kids under 18 smack, 
speed, or any other classified hard drug, I'll knock on your door and help you nail him to the wall. Until then, I pass. Do you understand? I pass. Now take me back to jail. All the themes in the movie are totally relevant today, just as relevant as they were then. I mean, I think Telly Savalas sums up all of the themes. Like he says, what are you gonna talk about now, Captain? Your constitutional rights, invasion of privacy, freedom of choice, your family, your job. What do you want to start with this time? So it's like, yeah. like yeah. all of that shit, everyone is still complaining about today. And you exactly. know what I mean? And, and the marijuana thing, I mean, that's gotten better in a lot of states, but in other states, it's just like it was 50 years ago. Texas you know what I mean? the same way. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, ever, ever was. So, I mean, right. all the themes are just as applicable today. I mean, that's why I'm hoping we can bring awareness to your work, especially this, and maybe people will go out and buy this thing and like watch it. And then maybe somebody with real money and real power can get the movie and get it the release it deserves. You know, like, I mean, that's what I'm hoping. I'm sorry to wake you, Mac, but the pigeon's been released. Yes, sir, the morning papers. No, no, not a chance. Everything's covered perfectly from here. Redford, you son of a bitch, you broke about 47 laws. Charlie here, pigeon and horn, still headed east. Out. Now, Neil's gonna be in Washington by noontime, trying to dig it all out. Redford. Okay, Mac, thanks a lot. Yeah, good night. Redford. Oh, just a minute, Captain. Station here. Pigeon opposite Alfie's heading west, looking for a tow. 10-4, out. What are we going to discuss this time, Captain? Constitutional rights, invasion of privacy, freedom of choice, your family, your job. What do we start this time with, Captain? What most people don't get about Clay Pigeon is the music. I mean, when I could get Arlo Guthrie who was a staunch anti-Vietnam guy, you know. To, he gave me two songs, not just the first one, he gave me the second one. And then I did Laws for Protection of the People, but I had no rights to it. The guy wouldn't give me the rights. You know, I was divorced. And I go to the house to pick up the kids. Said my daughter, who was then about five, she says, Krabafalin's coming. I went, Great. Uh, you, know, you guys ready to go? You know, I'm trying to pick them up, you know? Yeah. And then I hear the doorbell ring and I open the door and there's Chris Christophus looking right at me. Oh, well, man, this is ridiculous. He said, why? He says, I've been trying to get a song of yours for months. He said, which one? I said, laws for protection of people. Well, wow. what are you going to use it for? I said, well, I want to play the whole song. Not just a piece of the song, the whole song. And if you'd like to see how I'm going to use it, why don't you come over to the studio and I'll show you. And so he said, yeah, I would. I'd love to do that. So he came over and I played this thing with me on the motorcycle with the cops and the yeah. poor guys on the side, you know, being fucked over by the cops, you know. And uh, at the end of it, he said, I got to tell you, dude, that's terrific. He said, you know, not only can you use a song, but it's going to cost you nothing. Oh, wow. I went, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And that's awesome. That's how I got that song. That's but when you think of the what's in there, two Arlo Guthrie songs, one Christopherson song, one song from Taj Mahal, the whistling. I love the fucking whistling, you know? Well, yeah. all the music's subversive. I, the lyrics uh, of all those songs are, to I mean, if you sit there and listen to what the lyrics are, it, it fits in right with the material. Yeah, laws for protection of the people. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you obviously put a lot of thought into the music. I mean, it's clear. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and not yeah. to mention the score, the score, too, you know. But the end was the best. That's what I'm talking about, the end, ending score. Cause, yeah, because yeah, what happened was, I used to take the kids up into Topanga Canyon, usually to see a guy that I know that had some fabulous stuff that we could smoke and... <laughs> inhale or whatever we're doing you know at the time sure <laughs> anyway uh the kids were out playing and i heard this strange fucking music man you know and i i went out 
one. And I asked him what it is. They said, oh, there are a bunch of guys that play. So I went up to their house. I said, can I listen? They said, yeah. And there are three guys in there. There's no music. They're just playing against each other, with each other, you know, <laughs> all strings, you know. And uh, I went, wow, that's great. Anyway, when it came time to editing that final sequence in the Hollywood Bowl, I said, man, I'm going to get these guys. So I get these guys, I go over to MGM, which you know as a 50, 60 person orchestra. John Williams won, I don't know how many Academy Awards, right there sure. with the orchestra. So they said, how do you want to do this last scene? I said, well, I don't really know, but I'd like to try something. Well, you know, you got a 40 man orchestra here. I said, yeah, I, I, I know that, but I've got a very weird scene going on up here. And I'd like to inject a little weirdness. And they went, what are you gonna do? I said, well, I'd like to have these guys come in and play. And they said, great, no problem. You got the music? <laughs> I said, they don't use music. The guy said, what do you mean they don't use music? I said, well, they, they improvise. And they go, everybody's looking at each other. Improvise? I said, look, look, it may not work, man. Let me just do it, and if it doesn't work for you, we throw it out, we'll go to the orchestra, because I know it'll work with the orchestra. <laughs> and they go, okay. So I get these guys in, and four guys come in with their instruments, and they sit down, they set up. I say, roll them. So they roll it, that last scene, and these guys start playing. It sounds so strange, them playing. I mean, and they finish, and they cut, and the director for MGM says, well, let's play it back. We play it back, and that's the music you hear right now. Oh, wow. It is so strange. You listen to that music. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. It is weird. <laughs> it's cool. Like and it, it ends, yeah. and the director says to me, dude, you nailed it. They were so appreciative seeing something new. When you go and you watch the film, and, you, and this music comes on, you're gonna go, what is that? <laughs> you're not even gonna be, you're not gonna be conscious of the music at all, because it fits so well into the strangeness of that scene. It does. It, it's like really creepy. creepy. Yeah. Like a dream. Yeah. Yeah. Ethereal. Ethereal, that's a good way to put it, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talk about the CIA shutting your movie down, just the subversiveness of the whole thing. They didn't want any of that. They hated pot smokers. They hated hippies. You know, Nixon hated them. You could do a whole podcast on why he made pot illegal because he was beat Nixon and all that and the hippie. He wanted to just completely squash all of those people. So, you know, it's proven now, like, you know, there's reports and books that come out that have proven the CIA were drugging people around that time. You know, Manson was one of them with LSD, making them try to recruit people. And the CIA was just trying to do mind control experiments in all of them and just see what the fuck they could do, just fucking with people. And that's all proven now. And it's just like, it just doesn't, you know, surprise me that you know, it's nothing for them to want to squash your film. You know, they could do all that crazy shit. It's just sad. My film was easy to squash. I mean, the, the attorney, all he had to say was, uh, we ain't gonna give this much distribution, yeah. Yeah, they had no vested interest anyways, really. So that's, combined with that, it was a no-brainer. And that's just sad. So that's what, you know, Chris and I want to hopefully get it its proper yeah. due. I want to bring yeah. awareness to it, you know? I, I got just really pissed with the way they were gonna not distribute the movie and the way they did it was really nasty i said to them well you're gonna have telly and uh burgess meredith go up to boston and i said no and uh i said how's it gonna open the only trailer they put up there was in the theater that it was gonna open in i mean it was a, a destruct job anybody wants to know how to destroy a movie come to me i'll tell you how you know, it makes you pissed when you, you know, I dive into this movie, you learn a lot about it, you watch it, and you enjoy it. It's a great film, and I've seen 10,000 other films that are just giant turds that have got way more distribution. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's like, what the F? You know, it's just, it's very unfair. 
when they did the truck seat, everybody says, well, how much of this truck seat are you going to use? And I said, I don't know. I'm going to wait and look at it. So I looked at it on two cameras and, uh, you know, it was okay. It took 15 seconds. And I looked at it at the slow-mo camera, which is in the helicopter. And I went, wow. So I'm going to keep the whole fucking thing. <laughs> oh, no. Runs a minute. I think it runs longer. I think it runs for yeah. almost two. <laughs> almost yeah, two probably. minutes. I mean, it just rolls yeah. and rolls. Actually, that's another groundbreaking thing you kind of did in that movie. I mean, it had been done before, but there's several just music videos in that movie. You know what I mean? Like you did oh, like, yeah. several full, they're basically like music video segments, you know, way before music videos, but they've done that in movies before, but you have, I think like three of them in the movie. I just love the, how experimental you were with the film. I mean, even like Dustin was saying, all the, the stuff about CIA and MK Ultra and all that stuff that was really going on at the time. There's hints of that kind of in the movie. I mean, there's even one scene in the movie that's like so brief. It's right before you attack Telly Savalas and you put the gun in his face, where Telly Savalas is getting out of the car and there's this weird overlaid shot of Telly Savalas in the mental institution with the straight jacket on and he's rolling around yeah, on yeah, the wall. Yeah, 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 and yeah. And you're like, wait a minute, is the government like using MK Ultra on him? Is he like programmed somehow to kill? Like, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, like, yeah. like, I mean, it's, but that's what I like about it, you know? Um, I love too how it's vague, right, Chris? Like, you're not sure, like, is the FBI, CIA, police? What the fuck? Oh, you don't know who he is. Yeah, he never yeah, says who he is. He never yeah. says if he's, what organization he works for. You gotta remember, in my brain, the grenade went off. Sure. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it said to me, well, I can do whatever I want. I mean, I can make a jail white if I want the jail white, and I can be the only one in it. Yeah. And everybody will say, what the hell is a white jail if he's in it alone? Yeah. I don't give a fuck. I mean, you know, that's what happens when yeah. you, it isn't real. <laughs> I just thought of another music video, by the way. There's a music video when you're swimming naked in the with the naked girls oh, yeah. in the pool, too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's a couple music sequences. Who the hell put a dream sequence in as a... Me, you got a yeah, pool. Yeah, yeah. Are you yeah. kidding? You can tell you wanted that in there. Oh yeah, I loved it. I'm kidding? sure you did. I'm sure you did. Angela. You know the scene where you ambush Telly at his apartment, put the gun in his face. Telly was playing it like he couldn't really give a shit that he had a gun in his face. He wasn't scared. And that, you know, a lot of actors would have played it, you know, like, oh, okay, I'm sorry, you know, like, calm down, calm down type of shit, you know, and he just played it like fucking cool as a cucumber. Was that Telly or was that you? Is no, I, ba I basically told him, I said, you're not scared of me, you know. No matter what I do, you know I ain't going to do it. So I'm not going to pull a trigger and kill off an FBI agent. Thank you. But I was pissed. You gotta come to the realization, you know, you, you can't shoot people just because you don't like something. Yeah. Right. That's a great scene. I love that scene. I, and I love what you're saying. Telly Savalas is so like, it's like every morning he gets up and has a fucking gun in his face. He's just kind of like, fucking, who gives a fuck? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. like you're, you're ranting in his face with that gun and he's just kind of like, 
you expect him to light up a cigarette or something. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. He's, so, he's yeah. just so like chill about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. He's so yeah. great. Like he brushes his teeth with a fucking thirty-eight. I, I personally have told everybody that I don't want any acting at all. You don't have to think of things or try and bring up an emotion, actor studio or improvisational work you've done in your life I said don't do anything just say the words because you've got to look right now you don't have to do a goddamn thing that's how I cast you don't want to get an actor that's gonna pretend to do the role when a guy looks like the role speak if I don't believe you I'll tell you I think actors appreciate that that you know it's confidence coming from you and it makes them feel like fuck man I can I can do this I'll do anything then you know I got this Merry Christmas from a dead little girl. Where were your boys when Tracy got it? Shaking out some poor teenager for a joint? Life's expendable, isn't it, in your job? Tracy didn't mean a thing to you, huh, you dirty bastard? I thought there was a reason why that grenade didn't go off. There was no reason. It was a fluke, that's all. You need help, Joe, and we can do it together. Together? Do you know what together is? God and country, mom and apple pie. Blood and murder, indifference and hate. Take your pick. They're all together. You're reciting your own epitaph, hero. You're not in the jungle anymore. I like directing. I, I'm kind of annoyed with myself that I didn't uh, go after that from that time on. You had a talent for it, for sure. I mean, you can uh, see it by that. That last scene is so great at the Hollywood Bowl. I mean, it's a shame you didn't get a chance to do more of that. You know? Is that what you preferred to do out of all three, if you had to pick one, directing, producing, or acting? Be directing. Well, if, I, if you give me a, a role that has some fucking meat in it, like a beginning, middle, and end, I love acting. Mm -hmm. But short of that, I'd rather direct. I got yeah. a good, good visual eye, and I don't take much shit from people, so it all kind of works out. <laughs> in a sense, even as a, a as a producer, like when you're producing Hell's Angels '69, for instance, uh, Lee Madden directed that. But in a sense, as a producer, you're kind of directing. I mean, you're you're uh, there yeah. saying what you want, what you want to see. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, it's yeah. not a big leap, right? I mean, no. not a huge leap. It wasn't a leap for me at all. Yeah, yeah. that's what I figured. And as far as the logistics that are concerned, I love logistics. So and my idea of planning the Hollywood Bowl, I only had a day to shoot the whole fucking thing. And when you think of how much film I got that day, one day, from the yeah. top to the bottom to the end to the police, to this and the water and the death and the shooting and the axe and the bail and the bail. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. You know, that was a hell of a day. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you definitely got your character with the character arc on that one, the beginning, <laughs> middle, and the end. Because, I mean, you're a soldier, then you're a stoner hippie with flowers in your hat, and then you're an axe-wielding psycho by the end, you know, <laughs> smashing his head on that railing over and over You want to kill me? I want to kill you. There <laughs> yeah. you go. Thank I mean, you. <laughs> you change. You change a lot by the end. Yeah. But, um, well. With each viewing too, I see more in the film and I enjoy more about the film too. And and, and it's an important movie. I mean, it's an important movie in the sense of uh, just being the first movie to ever have a Vietnam vet returning home. I mean, you know, this is before coming home. This is before Deer Hunter, before all that, you know. Um, and it is, you know, it is a genre movie, Definitely. but underneath all the genre stuff, you know, you're trying to say something, which is interesting because a lot of those movies aren't trying to say shit. They're just trying to entertain you. And in some ways, maybe that hurt the film because 
Well, obviously it hurt the film because the studio and I guess the government, they wanted a, a genre movie. They didn't want something that had more depth to it, I guess. Which is a shame, you know, and after nearly 50 years without any formal release on any format, I mean, it's nice to finally get a bootleg on DVD that's worth watching, you know? Because I mean, I've seen that old VHS and it was, it was shit quality. So, I mean, at least we got yeah. that now. At least we got that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. That's right. Hopefully, you know, watch this and uh, go out there and, you know, try to find it and watch it because it deserves an audience, man. It's bullshit yeah. that it doesn't have one. Right. Uh, it's historic for that with the Vietnam bet. But it's also historic in the sense of that they suppressed the movie, they squashed it. It's only been aired once on, on television and that was on uh, Turner Classic Movies, I believe in 2006 or something. At two so, in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they played it after another movie. Yeah, yeah. Turner Classic Underground. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> I don't know what this is. I guess this is a coincidence or just a random theme in your career, but I've noticed a couple things in your career just from studying so much of your stuff. And I don't know if it's a, a, the era or what, but um, some of the titles of your stuff, like uh, 12 O'Clock High, you're in Angel Babe is the episode. Then you're in Angels from Hell. Then you're in Hell's Angels 69. And then Devil's Brigade. A lot of hell, a lot of angels, a lot of devils. Really? It was just, yeah, I was kind of like, wow, it's kind of <laughs> interesting, you know. I'm in In God's Hands. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a lot of there's a lot of that going on. Um, oh my God. I also noticed other little things. I mean, this is just uh, like in um, uh, in uh, in Angels from Hell. Uh, you're a biker leader and you guys meet uh, a producer named Sal that wants to make a picture with real bikers. I want to make a picture with real bikers, blah, blah, blah. And then the next film you made, you made a film with real bikers. <laughs> and then I also noticed in Hell's Angel 69, when you guys first see the angels, you look over at Jeremy Slate and you go, let's go get our pigeon. And then your next movie is Clay Pigeon. Oh, wow. So I just noticed a lot of weird, uh, yeah. I mean, maybe I'm just looking too deep, but I've been looking at so much stuff that all that yeah. stuff jumped out at me. Um, wow. I don't know. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> Actually. Hate you. 